Joining us here in studio, Mary Gordon. She is the president and founder of an organization called Roots of Empathy and the author of a book by the same name, and we are glad to have you in this studio. Thank you, Steve. Can we start by my having um, to read something here from the New York Times just to set up our discussion? It goes like this. We know that humans are hardwired to be aggressive and selfish, but a growing body of research is demonstrating that there is also a biological basis for human compassion. Brain scans reveal that when we contemplate violence done to others, we activate the same regions in our brains that fire up when mothers gaze at their children, suggesting that caring for strangers may be instinctual. When we help others, areas of the brain associated with pleasure also light up. Research indicates that toddlers as young as 18 months behave altruistically. Now this is news to me, and I bet to a lot of other people as well. So Roots of Empathy, we should establish off the top, tries to stop bullying of school children. And you, you do say that you try to tap into this biological basis for human compassion. So how does your program work? Well, we work with the attachment relationship between a parent and a little infant, which is the genesis of empathy. And the, the quote you read really is about the biological basis of empathy, meaning that empathy is something that exists in our brains and is exhibited in our behavior. It is something that is triggered by mirror neurons, and we are all predisposed to be empathic, but it is through initially the attachment relationship, how well we're responded to and loved, which develops our capacity to be empathic. So in Roots of Empathy, we bring a parent and an infant into a classroom over the course of a school year. We roll out a green blanket. The youngsters sit around the green blanket, and we have an instructor who uses a curriculum. And she guides the children in observing the baby's intentions and interactions and in labeling the baby's feelings. So there's a whole lot of perspective taking of the baby. So that what happens, the visit before the baby comes, the week before, and the visit after the week the baby has come, these are opportunities to project, predict, or to reflect. So we're really building on experiential learning from this little tiny teacher. The, te the infant is the teacher. The infant is the teacher. It is the field trip on the green blanket. Hmm. So the children are absolutely disarmed. They all fall in love with the baby. Everybody wants to be in the program. And it is from this launching pad of the green blanket that we are able to navigate the inner resources and recesses of the children's experiences, their ability to remember a time when they felt like the baby, and to share with one another. And it's called a social and emotional learning program. Mm. Let's just get some of the basics yeah. nailed down here. The infant sure. is usually how old? Two to four months when the program starts. Two to four in months October. old. Mm. That's a pretty new kid. And the and the other ch classroom children are usually what age or grade? Uh, it's all elementary school, but it could be kindergarten. There's a separate curriculum because children are very different at five mm. or four. So there are specialized curriculum for every age up to grade eight. And do you have stories of kids who, you know, don't have the reaction you'd like, but rather see a baby? scream and therefore they get upset and do something crazy? You know, it's remarkable. Out of more than 450,000 children, we've never had an incident. Never a one? Never an incident. Now, we have insurance up the yin yang because we're <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> we've never had an incident, huh. ever. And we've been, in, we've been in three continents. Con so, well, it, what it tells us is children are universally the one and that children identify the vulnerability of the baby and feel an instant connection to that baby, they find themselves in that baby. And it brings out, I think you mentioned the, the whole idea of empathy and the idea of compassion. It is, um, it's a free tap that opens. And we do know that levels of oxytocin, the brain hormone, rise when the, the roots of empathy baby is there. You have also worked with abusive parents, yeah. neglectful parents, and found that they lack empathy for children. Mm -hmm. Do you know what leads to a lack of empathy? Yes, a lack of empathy can be traced back to the attachment and attunement that the parent has with the little baby. And it's basically nobody's fault here. We're not blaming and shaming parents. It's something if you've had a very secure attachment in your childhood, you have this empathy. Now, life experiences can enhance or sometimes diminish that. 
But if you haven't had this capacity where you've been treated empathically, it's very difficult for you to know how to be empathic. So what we're doing in Roots of Empathy is creating the opportunity for children to see that experience and to develop empathy themselves. Something that can't be taught, but it can be caught. Not taught, but caught. Mm. What is it, if you are a child who has grown up with parents who are not empathetic, mm -hmm. what does that, does that necessarily mean something for your future? Yes, it means you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged in understanding yourself. You're going to be challenged in understanding relationships with others because that first relationship of attachment is a template for every other relationship in life. It's not that destiny is the relationship of birth but it pretty well sets a trajectory for children, and this is research-based. But you can do things to interrupt a negative trajectory. And Roots of Empathy is one of those things that's not medicinal, it's vitamins. And it gives children another uh, track in their brains. It's biologically embedding experience for children so that they have other options other than the one they grew up with. Where'd you come up with this idea? Well, I guess a long, long time ago when I set up um, Ontario's Parenting and Family Literacy Centers back in 1980, to do the outreach, I used to borrow a baby. And I would wear the baby. And anyone would talk to me. What, what do you mean you would wear it? I would strap on a snuggly. Hmm. Uh, we didn't call them snugglies in those Not days. Not 30 years ago, no. Yeah, and they, were, uh, they didn't have Velcro either. It was multiple <laughs> straps and strings and I would face the baby outward. There wasn't anyone who wouldn't talk to me. I used to outreach to the teenage prostitutes on the corners and everybody would speak to me. Because when you present yourself with a baby... We're defenseless. Right. People We're look all at you drawn in, yes. You couldn't be Jack the Ripper if you're wearing a baby. <laughs> so I guess the idea of the power of babies, um, that convinced me back in 1981, but also in outreaching to set up those parenting centers. We were working, I guess, mainly with mothers and babies. Now, we did have dads and grandparents and all sorts of other preschool children, but it was primarily we were working with the attachment relationship. And I was able to see the incredible power of the attunement of that parent to the baby's needs. or the mismatch and the parents floundering. And then you'd see that there were in many cases we would have domestic violence and child abuse and neglect. And in every single case that I dealt with where there was this adversity, you could trace back when you'd speak with the mom and try to help the mom, that she herself has experienced this. So then when you work with all the people in the children's aid societies, they'd say yes, slam dunk. But nobody had spoken about the intergenerational effect or identified that it was the parent-child relationship. So bringing that attachment relationship into the classroom, all the children immediately not only fall in love with the baby, but fall in love with the mother or father who come with the baby. And it is an invitation for the children to explore a time when they felt with the baby, which gets the children into dealing with their own emotional situation. Would boys and girls react differently to the seeing of the infant? I'm so glad you asked me that because the boys are heroic. The boys get a bad rap generally in life. Um, they're socialized differently in our society, but I promise you the boys are every bit as engaged with the baby and sometimes there's more jockeying for position with the boys to get close <laughs> to the baby. So Still competitive then? The, yes, the testosterone reigns supreme, but the boys <laughs> are very much um, affectionate with the baby and learning from the baby and we see huge changes in our boys and of course the classroom teachers who don't teach this program but they know their kids mm. they have amazing stories transformational stories of the boys in their class because of the boys connection to the little baby nice let's do some jargon here shall we I want to pass a bunch of expressions uh, by you yeah. perspective taking mm. what's that it's really being able to understand what the other person is thinking and feeling to, um, to be able to identify with what they see. Now, when we do this with little children, we put the baby on an infant role and we say to the children, now that the baby's on this role, 
what is the baby physically seeing that was different from when they were this beached whale on the, the green blanket and they couldn't lift their heads up. So the children will report physically what the baby is seeing, which allows us then to go to the more abstract idea of perspective taking, understanding what the other person is thinking or feeling. Empathy. Empathy, yes. And the cognitive aspect of empathy is perspective taking. It is a cognitive skill you can develop. The broader concept of empathy also has an affective component, which is emotion. It's one thing to understand what another person thinks or feels. It's their perspective. It's another thing to care. Emotional literacy? Emotional literacy is having the vocabulary, the name tags, for the template of the feelings that you have. And without this ability to identify and name these feelings, you can't be truly empathic. You cannot engage in dialogue with another person and connect with them on a deeply meaningful basis. And the difference here in someone who has this emotional literacy versus just perspective taking, you can only have a real friend when you understand how they feel. Hmm. Bridge to empathy. Well, I consider emotional literacy the bridge to deep empathy. Because if you think about what happens around the green blanket in all these thousands of classrooms, children are listening to their classmates talk about a time when they have felt lonely like the baby or when they have felt frightened like the baby. And in this disclosure, this very honest uh, vulnerability that the children feel safe to share with one another, it gives the, the kids insights into the, one another's feelings. And it gives them the vocabulary to pick up on that. So I call this the bridge to empathy. Gotcha. OK, three more areas that I want to explore in terms of the effect that your program has. Uh -huh. Number one, physical aggression. Mm -hmm. What's the impact? It reduces physical aggression by more than 50%. You've seen this. I haven't seen it in the schoolyards of the countries no, and the nations, but, but the, it, it the is researchers. Measurable. It's measurable, and there's a wonderful study that's recently published by uh, Manitoba where they have measured uh, physical aggression in children across, it's a longitudinal study following children of all the age levels three years out. Not only does the program, which is only one year, reduce physical aggression in that year, but it actually continues to reduce aggression as you follow those children three years out. We'll have that study on our website in case hey. anybody wants to check it out. Number two, indirect aggression. Well, these are the kinds of, of aggressions that aren't so obvious. They're more relationship, could be cyberbullying. They're often more hurtful than physical aggression. And they're more devastating, I think, because you can't defend yourself in the same way. And the thing is, when children develop empathy and the understanding that they can do something that hurts somebody else, and then they are impacted by that. It's a break against doing it. So that the research, and we've got many, many different research studies on this, show that there is a dramatic decrease in that kind of indirect aggression. Pro-social behavior. Well, that's the, uh, the kind of thing you want your kids to be around, where people and children are treating one another in a nice way. And the latest research says that actually empathy is at the base of pro-social behavior. And this pro-social behavior is what the poor school teachers are dying for. They want to be able to teach children instead of policing children. And when children are involved with pro-social behavior, which is caring, sharing, cooperating, uh, they can get on with the business of teaching. So obviously, teachers want roots of empathy in their classroom because the children behave better. How many kids have been through this now? More than 450,000 children. In what countries? Uh, well, three continents and eight countries. Three continents, eight countries, 450,000 50, kids. Sorry. You're having an impact. We're having a measurable impact. And it's, it's seen by the European Union, who's supporting studies in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And the program is now growing. Uh, we'll be in, in four new countries next year, mm. with invitations to many countries Korea, Japan, China, that we are having to put off for another four years. Is it too much to hope for a day when excessive bullying 
by children on other children will disappear. It's certainly not too much to hope for. It is not a rite of passage. It is a child abuse, and it is unconscionable that we know we have ways of reducing levels of bullying, and we keep saying there's no program out there that can do this. I guess the thing that annoys me is I don't put one red cent towards marketing or advertising. I put it into the classroom. And I think we're seeing a proliferation of programs that are the flavor of the month, and we have maybe not too well-measured investments. I think this is absolutely a problem that is conquerable. Mary, you're not wearing that Order of Canada for nothing, <laughs> so you must be doing something right. I want to thank you very much for coming into TVO tonight to talk to us about this. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.